Well, I'm Forrest Bird. I'm 85 years old, and I was born and raised in a town called Stoughton, Massachusetts. My daddy was a World War I pilot. He had his own airplane he bought in 1928. But in any event, he soloed me on my 14th birthday, June 9, 1935. Of course, a young lad, all I wanted to do was fly. But after I got to flying a little bit, I decided, well, I should know more about the airplanes. I wanted to build airplanes and so on. And then, of course, World War II came along. Now, by the time World War II came along, I had about 2,500 hours of flying, quite a bit for a young lad, but I was flying charter and instructing and so on, along with my school at that time. And at that time, what we had for oxygen was we had a free flow, and we used to call them horse bags. As you know, today in the airlines, you see them put this in the bag on the bottom, similar to that BLB mask. Well, anyhow, that's what we had. I started to play with this coming across the North Atlantic. The only problem was it, so it was a demand regulator. You, were, you had to suck your guts out to get it to release oxygen to you. And I said, you know, as an engineer, yeah, I can do better than this. <laughs> Doc Halsey was my flight surgeon, and he talked about pressure breathing, in other words, forcing the oxygen into the lung. And he said, well, what you want to do is have it force the oxygen into the lungs. So what happened was, at 28,000 feet, we couldn't fly over that because we just couldn't get enough oxygen and we, we become hypoxic like getting drunk and all the way through. Yeah, but yet our airplanes, we were coming out with the Minneapolis Sunnywell Turbo, the GE turbines, and you had a 40,000 uh, foot elevation with your airplanes. They'd go on upstairs, but you couldn't go up, physiological. And you know when they're shooting stuff up at your fanny, the higher you are, obviously the better off of you were. What I did was I had an aneroid, in other words, just a sealed chamber in there, and at 25,000 feet it would start to swell up and it started a free flow of oxygen. So it was easy to breathe in, you had to push out against it, in other words, pressure breathing. It seemed to work pretty good. So we got to 30,000 feet and back, we were really excited because we knew we, we, we had something, we really did. And I could never consider myself an inventor or anything else at that time. So consequently, but what uh, Dr. Halsey suggested was, well, he said, you know, uh, Colonel Armstrong, he was the head of uh, aviation medicine. He was the old man. He was 42 years old at the time, and he was at Randolph Field in San Antonio, Texas. And I brought a prototype in, and I told him what I was doing, and so on. First of all, he questioned a little bit, and he looked it all over and so on, and he said, well, talk to my fellows. He brought several fellows in. Tell them what you were doing. In the meantime, he got an oxygen cylinder out, and he was hooking it up. And as we were going, he started to breathe on it. He says, well, this is nothing but a demand regulator. My heart went down like this. But he says, a damn good one. Oh, boy, I was in business. <laughs> I was in business. So they had taken that and totally, they just took, mine was crude, but it worked. But they had really made a beautiful uh, production type unit out of it. And they brought Bendix and Arrow in, two different manufacturers. And within six months, that was in production. And that allowed our pilots to get up to 40,000 feet which was quite a breakthrough at the time. And you have to bring stuff down, keep refining, and you develop something, you don't quit on the original development, you stay with it. And I, you know, you might say, well, gee, I got a patent on it, and it's great, people will die if they don't have it, and that'll determine the price. No, don't ever set a price on brother up. In other words, be efficient to begin with, build it at a price, but don't hike it. Because if you hike it way up, you're asking for competition, aren't you? You've read about the Tasami, haven't you, out in the Pacific? Okay, now what happens there is you have a rapid uprising of the bottom, don't you? And it actually moves and displaces all that water. Now initially there's a shock wave that goes up. It's traveling 1132 feet per second per second. It is really moving, isn't it? So that shock wave goes out. Now as that shock wave moves out, it kind of drops the pressure a little bit behind it. But the main energy is way back here. You've displaced all that water now and you pushed it up. And you've actually got a tidal wave going, but it's traveling, 1132 feet per second per second. You don't see it, it's underneath. But all of a sudden, here's shore, and it comes and hits this resistance. Now you have velocity going this way, and then the friction will change that to pressure. So what happens is you get a back pressure this way first. So all the water pulls back here, and then that energy comes up, and wow, it's just overwhelming. Let's look at Asian flu. Let's say now we're in Indochina somewhere. We have a crossover. Instead of animal to man, it's man to man. And somebody leaves there on a feeder airline. They don't know they've been inoculated with a human to human virus. 
influenza virus. They get on an airline, they get into the international, and there's two or three hundred people on the airplane. Eighty percent of those people are inoculated with it, don't realize it because it's about three days. So that airplane goes to the next terminal, those people get out, they inoculate eighty percent. And within actually probably 36 hours the outside, the whole world has gonna end. And people really don't know it yet, because it's a three-day incubation. Within 72 hours, it's in our schools. That's how fast something like this can go. Now, 1918, you all read about the 1918 flu and so on. This is a repeat of this all the way through. And we think we're so damn smart all the way through. But we're not. We're not that smart because nature and, and powers beyond us. Yes, uh, Absolutely, they do. And we say, okay, fine, we've got vaccines, but how long does it take to make a vaccine? First of all, you've got to have the organism there, and then it's probably two years before you sort it out. The press is, oh, you're going to be able to get down and get a vaccine. And the problem is, yes, we have these in the hospital, but who's going to use those in the hospital? The medical staff themselves to stay alive. <laughs> so if you go to the emergency room, you think you're going to get in, good luck. <laughs> but I mean, this is real. This is the real world. And then now if you take act in mass casually in terms of uh, a terrorist blowing something up, that's going to be confined to an area. Now, of course, if they take and have a nuclear device, which I never believed a few years ago we used, but I'm not so sure now. I thought it would always be biological. But you'll have a core where it kills everybody. And then, of course, we go out. And then a lot of those people, if you take your red cell, the red cell transports your oxygen from your lungs out to your body. And they have, they're made uh, in the bone marrow, and they have about a 110 day life, and then they just wear out, and the spleen breaks them up. Well, if you don't have any new ones made, being made, probably within probably half of that time, you start getting weak because you can't get out enough oxygen and so on, and then you finally die. Now, as you get further out, if you can get these people and ventilate them and take care of them, you've got a high survival rate. So you have a ring system. The military's worked that out pretty well. Now there, we would not need that many devices, and we would keep a lot more people alive. But that kill in the middle, of course, is 100%. So no matter how you look at it, it's not a good situation. That's too bad man hasn't learned to live with each other. You know, we in medicine, we spend our lives trying to keep people alive, and those on the other side, of course, try to destroy. And that's normal state of affairs for mankind, isn't it?